I'm reminded of a phrase by hearing you describe it that way. And I'm probably going to butcher this phrase a little bit. I'm paraphrasing it. Um, but the phrase is smooth seas make for a terrible sailor. And so essentially what that, that saying is saying and what you're, you're getting to in your point as well is that if everything always goes smoothly, you don't have as much room for growth. If you look at the stories of most people who you would deem successful, no matter how you term success, whether it's financial, physical, uh, metaphysical, whatever it is, you're, you're going to see paths of failure. And that's because, like you said, failure creates that fertilization for growth. It creates the opportunity to realize how we can go forward. I think it was Edison, and this is probably one of those situations where people attribute quotes to people who never actually said the thing. He <laughs> was like, I didn't fail to make a light bulb a thousand times. I learned 999 ways it didn't work. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. And it's, it's absolutely true that show me somebody who um, was born into an easy situation that was buffered from all of life's crises that maybe had a silver spoon in their mouth that was overprotected by their family. That person goes out into the world they are so ill prepared for life because I've I'm I'm knocking on sixty. I have yet to meet somebody who didn't face trial and tribulation, and and when you have none of that, and then you get hit with it, you're not equipped. And so mm -hmm. my children, my story is, um, I sat my children down when they were very very young. They were five and seven years old, and I I could cry remembering what that was like to say. I'm leaving daddy. We're getting a divorce. We're going to live in two different households. And, and they struggled a lot. And there was a part of me that knew, and I share this with my clients, we don't wish it on our children. And as hard as it is at a young age, they, there's so much that they can learn about how, okay, the sky didn't fall, the ground mm -hmm. didn't eat me up. This thing that scared me so much didn't define me and didn't crush me. And so as adults, when we go through something like this, the fear is still the same. I can't tell you how many people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s come to me and they are scared to death as they emerge on the other side and they're more mm. self-confident and they're more articulate and they're, they're clearer and they've, they've refined themselves and they have this sense of confidence. Um, they've emerged such a refined version of themselves. And, and to your point, you look at scientists, um, you look mm. at you, um, all-star uh, uh, athletes, you look at, financial successes, they all have a story of trial and tribulation that shifted something to enable them to catapult forward. I think one of the things in that story that you're, you're talking about there is the disruption of what we know. And you kind of mentioned it earlier on, not in those exact words, but um, whenever we disrupt what we know, we start to wonder if we're making poor choices that led us here. So that first, from a child's perspective in that situation where you were saying you had to tell your children you're going to divorce, one of the most common refrains that I've heard, I haven't said the experiences personally, but is the child starts to wonder if it's their fault. Yes. And so that's the same concept that we have in divorce and stuff like that. Is this my fault? We're assigning blame to ourselves to try to um, explain why this has happened and potentially take on that mantle, if you will, of the person who caused this to happen. That's one of the ways we conceptualize. I mean, we, we understand these things, but I think we have to do the same for our growth through it. We have to do the same thing for how we come out the other side of it. Like you said, we come out, I'm, I'm still standing. This hasn't defined my life. So you get to wear that mantle as well as somebody who now that's part of your story. Who's overcome it. Why is Rudy such a beautiful story? Because of what he overcame. Nobody wants to watch the movie about the giant jock who just goes out there and beats the crap out of a little football team. That's not an interesting story. Nobody's right. watching that movie. It's Rudy because of what he overcame, because of everything else that was against him. And I think of, that's how I like to think of my trials and tribulations a lot of the time is that my story is boring if I just was born, Silver Spoon, and, you know, was already rich, married a beautiful woman, like passed all my tests on the first try, like just, just nothing. There's no trials and tribulation. And to the point that when people have that kind of life, it's not like their life is devoid of um, strife, if you will. 
they create not created. I shouldn't say that. That makes it that belittles their their the challenges they're going through. More so, your radar, if you will, for what causes that feeling of stress, that causes that feeling of trial and tribulation, is just calibrated differently. So for some to and it goes this extreme hyperbole, you know, here and stuff like that. For some children, it might be I might not eat today, you know, and for other people, and again, this belittles a lot of the the, the what you feel. So, oh no, I, I spilled coffee on my shirt from the day of my most important meeting. You know, these are very different real world feelings, but they both cause that same initial stress, that trial and tribulation feeling. Absolutely. I, I remember my daughter um, went to Honduras when um, with our church one year and and it was amazing, gone for whatever, seven to 10 days and um, heading out, what was important to her changed so much when she came back because she was around a community of children who were so grateful and appreciative for the very bare basics. And all of a sudden, my friend has a newer iPhone than me and all of the stuff that, that you know, in this first world problems that we have. Um, so there is a shift in that. And, and I want to speak to something else you said. The bottom line is as human beings, um, we're all uncomfortable with change and uncertainty. And so transition is change and uncertainty. And divorce is uncertainty on many, many different levels. Am I going to have time with my children? How much money am I going to walk away with? Am I going to be able to find a job to support myself as a single parent? Um, uh, are our friends going to continue to be friends with me? And on and on and on. And so, so to an earlier conversation of ours, which is where does your self-talk take you? It's very easy. It's very typical when we're going through a transition and there's a lot of unknowns. If you think about what you, what if, what if mm -hmm. I meet a great person and I fall in love again? What if I have a beautiful home? What if I land a great job? What if I have all the time I want with my kids? Nobody what ifs this way. Yeah. The what if is what if this nightmare happens? What if that nightmare happens? And so where our mind naturally goes is to the worst case scenario squared. And then we get paralyzed and then we react in panic and fear. And so there's an entire boiling pot of emotions that come up as a result of the uncertainty and as a result of the change that happens um, in divorce. And it's in that space where, um, where there's an invitation. The invitation, and for those listening, whatever your trial or tribulation is, the invitation is for you to step back, to become the witness of what's happening in your mind, the fear story, the um, maybe unworthy story, the less than story, and to really kind of poke at it. And Brandon, like you said, it's like that voice is talking to you in a way your best friend would never talk to you. Mm -hmm. And when you can detach a little bit from it, when you can witness it and realize that's not you, that's just a voice in your head, you can uh, create some space so that you're less uh, in that fight, flight, or freeze mode. Um, that happens because you truly feel right because you're telling yourself these stories. So I'm in danger of being eaten by a lion in whatever today's world is. And that's not true. And so a big part of slowing things down and being able to navigate divorce or any trial or tribulation with a little bit more calm clarity and confidence is to create some space between what's happening and what that voice in your head is telling you the nightmare outcome is going to be. And I think the ironic thing for a lot of people, again, I'm making general sweeping statements, so I'm not applying this to any one person. Nobody feel like they need to defend themselves or anything. But when you see the stereotype of a married man, right? One of the what ifs they constantly tell themselves when they're married is what if I was single, I could date all these women, I could do all these things, right? until the divorce comes about. Now, like you said, because of the way our minds work, they start to go with the what if I never find anybody? What if I do? And it's just interesting to me how those 
the juxtaposition of those two positions, right? Yes. Because they are such polar opposites. And now that you have the opportunity to live out those what ifs you had when you're married, now you're we're, you want back into marriage. And that's who we are. They always talk about like the grass is always greener on the other side because we constantly want what we are not capable of having currently. And just again, to go a little bit hyper motivational here for a second, just because I heard this saying recently and I do like it. It's like the grass isn't greener on the other side. It's greener where you water it. And so that's where you feed back into that whole thing, where you start telling yourself, the what if I meet this amazing person? What if I now am able to take a job that I couldn't have taken because I would have had to move my family with me or something like that? Like all these type of things. And that's taken, by the way. I don't know why I used the wrong tense of take there. But um, <laughs> those are the type of things that I think are very important when you're talking about that. And I think that's one of the things, to your point, that allows a trial and tribulation to become the catalyst for that great development. Yes. And, and I love that you use that saying. It's a saying that I've used many times. And a lot of times what I'll say to my clients is um, you, have two, you have two pots. Um, one is filled with flowers. The other is filled with weeds. Your mind mm -hmm. is miracle grow. Which one are you watering? We're watering the weeds. And, and it's like you don't have to do that. And that, that shift, that ability to... Um, to notice and change is a huge part of the growth because when you can do that, when you feel like you're in danger, right? Your life is in danger in whatever way. Uh, that's not a skill you lose once you have it. Um, you, you might have temporary amnesia with the next tribulation that comes up, but temporary. And then it's right there because you've, you've worked it and you've learned how to, challenge your thoughts, how to not attach emotionally to a thought. It's just a thought. Um, and, and that just really helps people move the ball forward in a, in a healthy way. And I've seen that phrase take place in very literal fashion very recently, as I've had some issues with the irrigation system I had installed with some new sod. And so literally where the grass was not being watered, it was brown. And then where it is being watered, it's yeah. vibrant and green and lush and everything like that. So and I know that that's a phrase that people just like to say for those various reasons. But I, I've seen it. I've seen it in real world <laughs> where the grass was not being watered. It was brown. It had nothing to do with being on the other side of the fence. It just was not being watered. And to make matters worse, I live in Florida where normally it rains like every day at 4 p.m. But right when I get the sod installed, it's like, you know what? We're going to turn into uh, the Mojave Desert or, or whatever desert doesn't rain in, right? Like, it's just, we're never going to rain. You're going to get that brown grass and we're going to kill it. So, and I think sometimes that's why we feel when those terrible things are happening to us, right? When we're going through those trials and tribulations, we feel like it's never going to rain again. We're never going to be able to water that grass. We're never going to be able to turn what now feels like a, a barren patch of land into something that's lush and growing and vibrant again. And we look at our lives that way all the time. And I, I think to your point, you can grow whatever you want to in this land. The land is capable. You have the land, of course, now we're just going too far down this analogy route, <laughs> but, but being that you can continue to grow whatever life you want to from where you came from. Um, and just to, to paint this picture a little bit differently too, I didn't grow up in a house where marriage was, uh, was around, right? Like, so there was no divorce uh, speech because there was never a marriage. And so I developed in that world. So when I hear friends and people talk about like their parents getting divorced, I'm like, it's such a foreign concept for me because I never even had the first part of that equation. So I don't even know, like they get really heartbroken and sad about it. I'm like, and I just don't know how to relate. I'm just like, I don't understand is like, that happens all the time. <laughs> right. And, you know, I think that that brings us back to something we talked about earlier, which is mm -hmm. uh, the younger generation and, um, the fear of, I, I, I do believe that um, marriage, uh, the rate of marriages is down significantly. And that fear of, well, geez, every other person seems to be getting divorced. So maybe I won't even go that route. And I think that there's really a very valuable conversation to be had that when we get into intimate relationships, what comes to the surface, it's like jumping into a mucky pond mm -hmm. and all of the muck comes to the surface. And the muck that comes to the surface is what we were raised in. And so what I have found over a dozen years is we marry a version of our mother 
and father or of our parents, right, of our two parents or of whoever the caregivers were. And so we're raised, that's our first intimate relationship. If you have a mom and dad or two moms or two dads, whatever you have, grandma, like there's so many different families out there, but those are the personalities that are our our primary intimate relationship and our siblings. And so I have clients who are seriously codependent and they're like, it wasn't mom or dad. It was because of a sick sibling or it was because of something else. And so when young people get into a relationship, the opportunity, the rub is the opportunity. If you think you're going to get into an intimate relationship and it's always going to be that like sex, chemistry, awesomeness, it's not. Life happens you're coming with two different blueprinted um, sets of beliefs and then the rub happens and the rub doesn't mean the relationship is wrong. The rub is the point of the relationship. Mm -hmm. The rub is what invites us to grow. And with our divorcing couples, we get to look at all of the rubs, all of the invitations, the ones that they didn't hear, they didn't see, that they tried to deal with um, so that they can learn from them. And so the, the flip side of divorce is intimate relationship. And there's going to be arguments and he or she is going to show up in a way that's displeasing to you. Thanks for checking out Starting Nowhere. Come find us on Facebook so you can comment on this and other clips and episodes of Starting Nowhere.